Okay, so our next speaker is in love with disruptive ideas. He's a consultant to early stage startups and he knows a thing or two about taking risks. And that's because he used to be a flying trapeze artist. So to all startups out there who are about to risk everything and take the leap of faith, Ivan Hernandez is your guy. A big round of applause for him. Thank you. One, two, one, two. Thanks. All right. The safest thing you can do is to take risks. The, risk, the riskiest thing you can do is to play it safe. I love this statement by Seth Godin because it clearly shows what is our reality today. We live in a world in which you need to be willing to take risks. And if you want to be successful, if you want your company, your startup to succeed, you need to take risks. The reality is that you are where you are, not because of luck, but because you are, you are where you are because you took risks that others were not willing to take. Taking risk means embracing change. The problem with change is that change is scary. We don't like change. If you say you like change, you're lying. A lot of people don't like change. For a long time, I used to say that the world has changed, but the reality is that it's constantly changing. And it's changing really, really, really quickly. But the reality today is that change is imminent, and it is essential for survival. Tim Brown from uh, IDEO said it very nicely. He said that we are at a critical point where rapid change is forcing us to look not just at new ways of solving problems, but to new problems to solve. Rapid change. The pace of change is going faster and faster. What does that mean? It means that we need new strategies. We need new ideas, we need new products. And the moment that we start talking about new ideas, new products, new strategies, one word comes to mind. Innovation. Now, uh, I agree with Alf and I, rem I, rem I agree with Scott, what they were mentioning earlier about, uh, unfortunately, innovation has become a meaningless buzzword. But that doesn't mean it's important. And we can spend hours talking about what is and what is not innovation, but I see a problem. A problem is that a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, they understand innovation as what I call incremental ideas. Basically, all they are doing is taking the safe path, you know, just improving slightly their product or service. So it's about making your product a little bit better, or a little bit smaller, or a little bit thinner, or a little bit bigger, whatever. And that's what most organizations are currently doing right now. And that's what they consider innovation. And up to a certain point, that's OK. But the problem is, if that's the only thing you do, this might drive you through a path that someday, sooner or later, you might get to a point that you can no longer make the product a little bit slimmer, or a little bit bigger, or a little bit smaller. Or you may get a completely uh, a, an outsider and another player coming out of nowhere arriving and kicking your ass. Why? Because all these constant shifts that are currently happening. Uh, the record industry, if you think about it, this is what happened to the record industry. There has been this shift from owning products to having access to the experiences. In the past, it was all about buying the CDs, buying the MP3 files through iTunes. Today, I don't need to buy the CDs. I can have access to the music. And these shifts are the ones that are making big, big disruption in the market. And what I want to avoid is I want to avoid talking about technology. The eh. thing about technology is that it's very easy to jump into you know, the, the sexy new programs and, 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 and applications and stuff. What I really want you to think about is actually your thinking, your mindset. And if we're talking about disruption, we need to embrace disruptive thinking. Now, what's disruptive thinking? Basically, it's changing the way you think about competition, and about the business you're in. Thinking differently. Start asking, what if? 
What if it's a fantastic question? What if, what if we could rent this empty space that we have over here for these people coming to a conference? Boom, Airbnb. What if everybody could be treated as a diplomat, that you know, a limousine arrived and pick you up and you don't even have to say where you want to go? Boom, Uber. Two really disruptive organizations that are killing it because they started to do things differently, not just incremental improvements. This leads to disruptive innovation. Alf is gonna hate me, I'm using two of his most hated words, but okay. Disruptive innovation, what's disruptive innovation? It's basically taking your product, your service, your business in a completely different direction. And it's about winning, not by doing things better, but winning by doing things differently. Now, am I talking about your product? Am I talking about your look? No, I'm talking about your business model. I'm talking about really understanding what is it that you do, how you do it, talking about all your cost structure, everything that is connected to your business. That's what I'm talking about. And to give you an idea, what is it that I'm talking about? Let's talk about socks. What do you expect when you buy socks? You expect that they come in pairs, and you expect that they match, right? Well, there is a company in the US called Little Mismatch that asks themselves, okay, what if we sell socks in packages of three and none of them match? I know, some of you are thinking that's a really dumb idea. Well, uh, no, this is a multi-million dollar company. It's a multi-million dollar company with their core users are, are eight to 12 year old girls that love those socks. They love them. Today, they're not doing socks, they're making toys, they're making bicycles, they're making bed sheets. And everything started from trying to do things a little bit different. That's what I'm talking about. Now, all this involves and requires a good understanding of design. Now, design is not just how things look, it's not just about the decoration, it's not about the feel of the product or service. Design goes much, much deeper than that. I'm gonna go back to my friend Seth Godin. Seth Godin said it very nicely. Design is learning how to see. It's figuring out where the opportunities really are. It's seeing the gap and visualizing in advance what is going to work. That's design. Good example of this, Dartmouth, Dartmouth University. Dartmouth University, many years ago, uh, they asked an architect to design the new paths in the main campus. And what most architects will have done, is they will say right away, they will come and they will start making some beautiful paths or something, right? And what this guy did what was something interesting. He said, okay, I'll take the job, but I will start after the winter. Like, okay, that's weird, but okay, you're the boss. What happened? The, weird, the winter came, lots of snow fell, and what he did is he went to the highest tower in the campus, and he looked down at the footprints left by the students. And based on the exactly all the paths uh, drawn by the students, he designed the paths in the campus. If you think about it, this is user experience at its best. It's about putting people first. It's about what we call human-centered design. It's about understanding that if you want to have a great product or if you want to have a great connection with your users, you need to understand their behaviors. It's not about features, it's about behaviors. Because the interesting thing about behaviors is that behaviors are never right or wrong but they are always meaningful. So I know we are in a, tech in a tech conference, but I will strongly recommend you to stop focusing in technology and instead focus on customer needs, wants, and behaviors. That's what is going to make the difference. But okay, we are in a tech conference, so let's talk about tech. Let's talk about digital. Digital. <laughs> What's digital? So it's a good question. 
What the hell is digital? What's digital? You know, every once in a while, clients ask me, what's digital? I'm like, you know, is it the internet and Facebook and mobile and apps? And they go, well, you know, yeah, okay, some of these things are elements of digital, but digital goes farther than this. The reality today is that digital is not a medium, but it's the era we're in. The world is digital. You are digital. Everybody's digital. And if we understand this, the changes and the impact that these technologies and these forces have on our behaviors, that's when we really need to understand all the possibilities of the things that we can do. Understanding these disruptive forces, we are living today a perfect storm. How many of you know what I'm talking about? No, I'm not talking about the movie with George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, Big Wave. Uh, I'm talking about the actual phenomenon known as the perfect storm. The perfect storm happens when three forces converge. I'm talking about warm air, cool air, and tropical moisture. Now, these, each of these forces, we have contact with, it, with them individually every day. But when they get together, stuff like this happens. Now, I'm not here to talk about the weather. I'm here to talk about our perfect storm. Today, we don't have three, we have five. Five forces that are changing everything. I'm talking about mobile, social media, data, sensors, and location. These five forces are changing everything. And the really interesting thing, again, each of these forces, we have contact with these forces every day of our lives. But when they get together and they converge, that's when really interesting things start happening. And if you think about it, we have all these five forces in our pocket. Interesting times. Now, these forces allow the access to disruptive technologies. Brian Solis, he said very well, uh, all these new technologies, really exciting technologies that we have today, you know, wearable technologies, ma the makers, beacons, internet of things, all this is happening because we have these forces working together. We have real time, mobile, social, all of these surrounded by the cloud. And this is what's making the difference. Ah, uh, but oh boy, we have a problem. The problem is that most organizations, most people in the world are having a very hard time to keep up with this really uh, fast pace of change. They are really slow or they are too big to act, to react properly. And that's a problem. I don't know, how many of you had the opportunity to read uh, last month uh, this report by the New York Times? For some of you that might know, uh, BuzzFeed last month leaked an internal report that some uh, executives at the New York Times prepare on their current situation on regarding digital. And it's fascinating because they are struggling really badly. And they put everything there, and this is supposed to be an internal document, somebody leaked it, and now you can have access to it. And, and it's fascinating. I strongly recommend you to check it out, because this shows the reality today, that there are many organizations, big or small, really struggling to keep up with these new times. And this will help you understand that, at the end of the day, it all comes down to how we embrace disruption. This is why it's going to allow us to better understand and in turn react to it. We are getting to the age of reacting, being fast and able to react quickly. And the really cool thing about this is that we are having a huge opportunity to integrate these digital technologies to your products, your services, your business, by creating new value. At the end of the day, this is what the, the, the name of the game today is adding value. Stop making banners and start thinking how you can add value to your, to, your, to your users. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let's talk about toilet paper. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about toilet paper? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> Bad question. Um, 
Okay, when you think about brands or producers, manufacturers of toilet paper, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when they promote themselves? Yeah, you have soft, you have, you have the, the kid, you know, touching it and showing how soft it is. Uh, and you have animated animals, you have puppies, uh, you have uh, bears. Uh, I've seen bears, yes. Uh, you have the whole family running on the, on the field, you know, happy, holding hands. Every single toilet paper company is doing the same thing. So, there's a company called Charmin in the US. Uh, this is a company that makes toilet paper that built a mobile app. Mm -hmm. They built an app called Sit or Squat. This is a mobile app that gives you the location of public restrooms. So imagine, one day you're on the street, I don't know, you have kids, or uh, you had very bad Mexican food the night before, I don't know, and all of a sudden you have to go to the toilet. And you know, instead of wandering around and panicking and you know, sweating and wondering what to do, you open the app, the app tells you what's the location of your clean, this, the closest bathroom. If it's green, it's clean, it's safe, you can go. If it's red, Avoid at all costs. Don't go, don't go there. Even better, it's, it's the users are the ones that are you know, giving the data. You go to the toilet, <laughs> and you can give a rating, and you can give the details, and you can give comments. It's fascinating stuff. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Yo. Let me tell you about it. If, like again, I the next time you go to buy toilet paper, if this app save your butt, literally, uh, chances are you're going to buy this brand instead of your other brands. And again, this is what I'm talking about, thinking differently. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, for many years, they have been focusing on the concept of happiness. Now, what's happiness? Well, they realize that for a lot of people, especially for teenagers, happiness means having access to the internet. And they come up with a very cool idea. They, uh, in, in Brazil, they realize that over there they have a very low level of access to Wi-Fi. So, teenagers are sad. Mm. So what did they do? They built a refill machine that looks like just, just like the machines that you use to refill to get more drink, more Coke. And instead of that, when you put your phone in it, it gives you free credits to have access to the internet. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is an idea delivered by Coca-Cola. Water with sugar, that's what it is. It was not created by a telecom company. This is what I'm talking about, thinking differently. Stop making just advertising about saying how great you are and start adding value. And chances are that you're looking at this and you're going, oh my god, this is such a cool idea. Great. At the end of the day, at the end of the day it's not about ideas. It's not about making ideas. It's about making ideas happen. And what I strongly recommend you is to get your hands dirty. Ideas are cool. Ideas are great. But you really need to execute and implement those ideas. And if there is one piece of advice that I can give you, to all of you, is to develop a sense of urgency. This is a big problem. Time and time again, I see from both sides, you know, organizations or people that are uh, understanding this new digital reality, you know, stuck on, you know, we are working on this, we're doing some research, we're thinking about, yes, we're thinking about, no. This is your time. You are way ahead of all these people that are struggling with this. And in the case, if you are part of this group of organizations or, or individuals that are struggling with this, if you're having problems coping up with all this new, new pace of change, you really need to change your mindset. Again, it's not about technology, it's about thinking. It's about replacing the fear of the unknown with curiosity. It's about experimenting. You need to experiment, you need to try things. If you keep it safe, and you keep doing what you've been doing on and on and on and on, you are not going to learn, you are not going to find out what works, what doesn't work. You really need to experiment and try new things. Some advice that I give to some clients, 
you know, simple. I'm not saying make a revolution, change everything. What I'm saying is, you know, look at your budget. 70% of your budget, put it into the things that you know work. If you work, and, and let's say advertising, if you work, you advertise on TV and works for you, awesome, keep doing it. 70% of your body going to that. 20% put into things that you, know, you are learning and you are, there are platforms that allow you to get a better return in what you're trying to accomplish. But 10%, that 10% is what is going to make the difference because this is the 10% that allows you to explore, that allows you to experiment and to try new things. Because, and, and this 10% is important because these new models in five months, in six months, in a year, these might be the new business models that are going to change your business. And if you don't start today to experiment and to learn what works and what doesn't work, you are not going to be able to survive in the future. That's the reality as well. And wrapping it up, all what I'm talking about, I'm talking about change. This is not about digital. This is not about strategies. This is not about innovation. This is about change, about embracing change and about being willing to try and embrace change. And some of you might be thinking, well, uh, I don't like change. <coughs> and to that, I want to share the very wise words of Eric Shinseki. He says, if, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Think about it and go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for a very inspirational talk. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, basically what I would like to talk about is how to put all these disruptive ideas into practical use. And since you are a digital innovation strategist, what if a company comes to you and they say, OK, we want you to write a digital strategy for us. It's a multinational company. And of course, it may depend on type of the company, on the product they use. But what are the necessary steps you will do? What is the research method? What is the planning? How does that look like? Steps. Well, well, I think, first of all, the most important is understanding what's a strategy. If you think about it, most people don't, you know, we use the word strategy for everything. I hear our strategy is to be the number one company in this and that. And I'm like, that's not a strategy. Uh, it, what's strategy? Strategy, it's the practice of getting from here to here. That's it. So if you want to build a strategy, you need to understand, you know, five things. Uh, where you are, uh, where you want to be what's standing in between, what's the approach that is going to get you there, and what's the actions? What are the actions that are going to, you're going to implement in order to get there? So that's pretty much what I do. I go into organizations and, and, uh, uh, and, and start small revolutions inside, helping people to change by really defining what are those five elements that we need to accomplish. So I, I won't say it's a methodology or step by step, but it's about really having a good understanding of where you are and where you want to be. Okay, so besides good analytical skills, which are necessary, what is that skill set that one needs to become a digital strategist? So what are things, what are the marketing concepts they need to understand? What, what do they need to do? Because there's obviously no um, way to learn that in an easy way. Yeah, there's what, what, are, there's what do you no, recommend? There is no strategy university. Um, okay. I think there are different elements. One is empathy. I think at the end of the day, if you're a strategist, you really need to put yourself in the, in the shoes of your users and really having a good understanding, again, of their behaviors. Um, I think that is, that, that's key. Uh, when you understand what is it that your audience or your users want, uh, not because you make an analysis, but because you really feel it, you are there, that makes a difference. Uh, now, one thing that you mentioned, because being a digital strategist, that's not really fancy. I'm a digital strategist. Um, I strongly believe that we are getting to the point that there is no difference between digital and traditional. Uh, and, and, and what's the difference between a digital strategist and a strategist? There's no difference. Uh, yet, I mean, I, I have that fancy title because, uh, as I mentioned, there are many organizations that are struggling to adapt. And they are still working like 30 years ago, and they are just trying to use the same way of working from the past with new technologies. 
and then they wonder how thi why things don't work. Yep. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's basically something we actually heard uh, people that also think in this direction. There was Elena Jeleva who talked about design thinking. Mm -hmm. So it's also when you put yourself in the shoes of a user. Absolutely, design and thinking it's, is... Yeah, it's very relevant. So it's if you want to understand the company, go and work there for a while. If you want to understand the product, buy the product, play with the product, or, or be involved in the creation of the product. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, for example, the way I work. Uh, I always joke that, you know, I, I hate consultants, even I'm one, I'm one of them. Uh, because most of the consultants, if you think about it, th th their work is to go to a place, uh, you know, use a methodology, the same methodology that they've been using for the last five years, uh, make a report, some PowerPoint presentations, give the presentation to the clients, and leave. And I think that's really dumb. If you get a consultant that offers you that, you can, you know, you have my permission to kick them out of the room. Uh, what I do, and I think that is, it's, it's, it's better, is to actually go inside the organization. Uh, I, 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 the different clients I work with, you know, I go inside the organization, I work with them, I understand the work dynamics, I work, I understand how people work, uh, I understand what are the problems, and from inside, that's when we start making, you know, being a catalyst of change. Uh, and that's what I think is the most effective way to, to, to do things, not yeah. just by giving advice. Exactly. Uh, one more thing, and I'll, again, I'll go back to the other speaker said the day before and today. Like, there is a lot of things happening right now at the moment. And like our friends said, like every week or every day there is a new book on innovation published, and there is a lot of garbage, there is a lot of good stuff. But how to keep up with the trends? What do you do? What, what are blogs to read, what are books to read, conferences to attend, people to follow on social media, like just give us a piece of advice right there. How wow. to filter this amazing amount of information. Yeah, how, how much time we have. Huh? Yeah. Um, the last question, I, I promise. I, I love that uh, Clay Shirky once said something very, very smart. He said that the, the, the problem is not information uh, overload. The problem is information filtering. Um, exactly. I think that if you, uh, and I'm not just talking about strategy or, or business, I'm talking about if you want to be able to ke keep up with this new reality that we have today, you really need to be A, hungry for knowledge. You really be always uh, having the mindset of being open to learning all the time. And not just from books, not just from seminars, not just from conferences, but, but learning from every single interaction with you have with everybody. Um, I, I mentioned it yesterday when I asked the question to Tony Conrad. Uh, it blew my mind. He is the founder. He's a really, really successful entrepreneur and investor. And he spent the whole day yesterday helping people make their profiles on their about me, their about me profiles. If you think about it, that's mind blowing. No many people do that. And when I told him that, I'm like, dude, Many people here don't know who you are. I know who you are. You, sh you, you don't need to do this. And he's like, man, you need to leave your product. The fact that you're the founder of a company, that doesn't mean that you need to be in a bubble. And that's really inspiring stuff. Uh, talking about books, talking about blogs, oh my god. Uh, I, can, I can say, uh, you know, there is some incredible thought leaders outside, uh, out there that are doing remarkable work. Uh, I would highly recommend you, for example, uh, Mitch Joel. He's, uh, uh, he's the CEO of a Canadian uh, agency called Twisty Marsh. He's outstanding. That's, that's one of the one, two, three blogs that I read every day. Uh, he also has a remarkable podcast every Sunday where he has conversation with thought leaders. It's fascinating stuff. Six pixels of separation. Uh, Brian Solis. Brian Solis, he does amazing stuff. His latest book, uh, WTF, What's the Future of Business, is really good. Uh, David Armano, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's been working a lot on the whole concept of social business uh, and, and communications and really making a difference through marketing across the organization. We're going to have the opportunity to see David later today. Uh, there's so much stuff. Uh, but yeah, whatever it is that you read, be open and really, really look forward to try to understand and keep up with all these changes because it's really fascinating. But if you're not able to adapt, uh, you're going to have a hard time. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we are a bit behind schedule, again, I'm going to open floor for the qu uh, for the audience for the questions. And you can ask anything except how Ivan became a flying trapeze artist. You're saving that for the end. Okay. Any questions? That there is a qu okay. Go ahead. Okay. 
I don't really care about trapeze artism, so uh, they told, told me that I have to get up. So one question about change, which is I think very important here. Uh, we all know that uh, ch uh, about change, the most important thing is persistence. And it's not really easy to be persistent, especially in a uh, conservative society like Montenegrin. So do you have uh, suggestions on how to be persistent in a uh, conservative society uh, and persistent at all when, when it comes to change? Because uh, I, I see our society as a society with a huge potential, but uh, with a big, uh, let's say, mess that is pulling us down uh, when somebody tries to change something. Yeah. Um, there is always a problem that there is going to be a lot of people that are going to s try to stop you and slow you down. Why? Because change is scary. They like the status quo. They like to keep things. They like to play it safe. Uh, I deal with this time and time again. You know, you meet with, I don't know, president of a company that they care about the next quarter. They are not thinking about next year or five years from now. Um, but I guess it's, it's about selling your idea and really being able to show people the value that you are providing and the difference that this is going to make, not tomorrow, not the next week, but down the road. Uh, if you are able to really show what's the value that you are, that that, that change is going to bring, it's going to be easier to bring to, 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 to for people to accept those ideas. Um, is it difficult? Yes, it's really difficult because a lot of people are afraid of change and they just want to avoid it. Uh, but this is when persistence comes into place. If you are sure and you are assertive and you know that your idea is going to be able to make a difference, uh, and you are able to show that difference. That is going to that is what is going to make uh, easier for you to really get people uh, to, to, to to get your ideas. But you know, show the value. If you show the value, it's going to make it easier. If you just say, "I'm going to make some changes," and if you are not able to show your vision, you're not going to be able to to to, to get people in. Okay, we have one question here. Uh, first of all, thank you for a really amazing speech. Thank you. And a um, really interesting question for me. Um, what do you think about future of marketing uh, tools? Because um, for this last five years, maybe, um, the market of digital tools, tools uh, are developing and changing. Uh, what do you think about future? Uh, and how it, was, uh, how it will change? maybe in the next five years? Um, hopefully, I've been, I've been talking about this for a long time, and, and slowly I see that it's, it's getting there. Uh, I think that the future of marketing is connected with the concept of utility, added value. Uh, empty stories and empty messages are no longer effective. We know that uh, bombarding people with our messages is no longer effective. Um, Altimeter Group made a, a, a research and showed that people are exposed to an average of 3,000 brand impressions every day. 3,000 brand impressions, that's a lot. And marketers hope that people are going to remember that banner or that advertising or that billboard. And unless they start thinking about how to actually add value and how to make a, a great experience, at the end of the day it's about adding value and it's about creating a great experience, they are going to have a hard time. Because at the end of the day, the companies that are really killing it right now are the companies that are doing that. They are making you feel better. They are making you happier. They are making you uh, smarter. They are giving you some value. Uh, and hopefully, more and more organizations are going to go in that direction. That's what I hope is the future of marketing. OK, let's just wrap it up in the trapeze story, because it's a very interesting one. And it's actually not a story about trapeze. It's a story about taking risks. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I mentioned I used to be a flying trapeze artist a long time ago. Uh, um, funny thing is, people ask me also, you were a gymnast or how, you know, a athlete or something. I said, well, actually, everything started one day. I, I used to work in a place that I, I was a windsurfing instructor back then. And on my way to home, there was a flying trapeze a circus school in the middle, right in between my job and my, my home. And every time I pass in front of it, and I didn't look at it at all. And one day, the, the guy responsible for that school, he asked me if I would like to try it. 
I'm like, well, okay, I'll try it. Uh, the thing about circus school and flying trapeze is when you try it, you have safety lines, and it's really safe. Like, the instructor is holding you all the time. It's no, there is no risk at all. It's really safe. So I went up, I tried it, I like it, it was fun. I come down, and the guy looks at me, say like, hey, would you like to try it without safety lines? I'm like, huh? And everybody around is like, huh? <laughs> uh, and I don't know, I had the feeling that he was testing me or something, so I just look at him and say, sure, let's do it. Take off my safety belt, go upstairs, get in the platform, he tells me, the only thing, the most important thing is, you have to do everything the moment that I tell you. Because if you do it a little bit too late, or a little bit too, 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 too soon, you're gonna get hurt. Because you're falling 10 meters down, and it's a free fall. No pressure. <laughs> so I go, I do, I do my swing and everything, and he say, okay, when I say hep, you let go. Hep. I let go, and I drop, and it's a free fall, it's a 10 meter free fall. I freaking love it. I mean, I came down of it with a huge smile, uh, uh, and, I, and that, that was the moment that I decided that is what I want to do. And uh, I asked him, why do you do that? And he said, well, I had the feeling that you, you had you know, talent to do it, so I just wanted to check. And uh, being a trapeze artist had a huge impact in my life because it's about taking risks. It's about you know, knowing that you know, uh, there is a hard trick, knowing that you are let, letting go, and you're in the middle of the air, and, and you are trusting your, your partner to grab you and to catch you. And all these dynamics are fascinating. And, and today, many of the decisions that I make are based on this feeling that I had that, you know, if you don't try, if you don't experiment, if you don't go for it, you are never going to find out. And, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Can we get one more round of applause for this very brave guy? <laughs> ah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.